I'm Christian Bryant. In tonight's show, we aim to answer a key question. If the US is ending its so-called forever wars, why are American troops still in Syria? Plus new frontiers in private space exploration and space tourism. But first, our top story. The stakes are high this NFL season. And no, I'm not talking about my team's potential. It's the Carolina Panthers for what it's worth. I'm talking about the wagers taking place before and during each and every game. More than 45 million Americans plan to make a bet this football season, according to the American Gaming Association. That's coming after Super Bowl 55, which that same association called the largest single event in American sports betting history. But football isn't the only sport people are betting on. According to BetMGM, soccer, tennis, baseball, and boxing matches also bring in a whole lot of wagers. Personally, I'm still waiting on pickleball to get in the mix, you feel me? It's all the result of this sudden shift in policy and technology that's created a whole new world of American sports betting, with promises of major rewards for some and major risk for others. Here's some quick background. Back in 2018, the Supreme Court overturned a law that had effectively prohibited states from authorizing sports gambling, except Nevada, obviously. Once that Supreme Court decision was handed down, many states wasted no time drafting up their own legislation to make sports gambling legal. Since 2018, more than half of US states approve some form of sports betting. Currently, that's 26 states plus DC. I mean, let's be real, sports betting was happening before 2018 all over the US, but now there's some structure around it. Legit platforms to go through, you don't have to worry about sketchy bookies, and a ton of advertising dollars to hammer home how fun and safe it all is. Step one, open the BetMGM Sportsbook. Step two, put some skin in the game. The live in-game betting is my idea. Now I can bet the game on FanDuel Sportsbook anywhere in Pennsylvania. Many states are using the funds collected from the taxes on these gambling payouts to improve road and infrastructure, schools, and scholarships. DC is even directing a chunk of it to the Department of Behavioral Health for gambling addiction and treatment programs. Overall, states have been able to make a pretty penny off legal gambling. To that point, New Jersey was one of the first states to usher in legal sports gambling. Last year alone, it made more than $6 billion in taxes off sports gambling, making it the country's largest sports betting market, even coming out ahead of Nevada, you know, where Vegas is. And it's far from the only state getting into the billions with sports betting. Pennsylvania, Illinois, Indiana were some of the big earners. But you know that saying about all things in moderation? Yeah, gambling can be super addictive, and this new frontier for sports gambling is raising red flags for some folks. The diagnosis for pathological gambling has similar characteristics to alcohol and drug dependency, according to the National Center for Responsible Gaming. That includes increasing tolerance, like betting more money to get that rush when placing a wager, symptoms of withdrawal, and the inability to stop or reduce gambling habits. Some betting companies like FanDuel and DraftKings do offer features to try and stem problem gambling like deposit and spending limits, but those are self-imposed. And when you have an addiction, setting those boundaries can be tough. The most recent research says six to 9% of young adults experience problems related to gambling. Of course, a big reason behind those concerns is the cutting edge convenience of it all. I mean, our smartphones are already addictive enough. Have you ever played Block Puzzle? As Newsies' Tyler Adkison tells us, that convenience factor is helping create a new booming market for online sports betting. In 1919, the Chicago White Sox, who played at then Comiskey Park, had their World Series title vacated after players bet on and subsequently threw the World Series game. Flash forward nearly a century later, and sports gambling is popular across the entire U.S., especially in the more than 25 states that have legalized sports gambling in some form. Technology has enabled sports betting to be this 24 hours a day, seven days a week opportunity, where previously you either had to go to a state where this was legal, and now we, we have it even more broadly. Um, you know, it's it's... It's at the end of your hand. How, how many people leave their smartphones far away from their bodies? <laughs> According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, mobile sports betting creates revenue for governments, but it also warns of increased gambling addiction, as well as people making poor financial decisions. 
The biggest sports betting market is currently New Jersey, where in 2020, mobile betting accounted for 95% of the nearly $50 million in new gambling tax revenue. In Pennsylvania, about 75% of the $39 million in tax revenue came through mobile. Sports gambling experts told Newsy that online gambling platforms have leveraged this technology to change the way that people place bets, like by providing in-game betting. There's so many different things to bet on. You don't just bet on who wins or the spread. You can bet on um, whatever is going on in the game, including you know, you know, what players are doing. You're not limited to just betting on a, on a game before it happens or a tournament or whatever. You can bet on outcomes throughout uh, when any event is going on, whether it's a golf tournament or a football game. Sportsbook operators told Newsy that the pandemic also provided an opportunity for them to line up new, non-traditional events for people to bet on. That's helped them draw new bettors into the fold and keep them betting on sports and events they might not have otherwise considered. Here we are, you know, sitting with this online product that we have and uh, with no content. So we had to go out and fish and find that new content. We did cornhole this past year. Uh, you know, we're looking at some some other new type of offerings, hopefully within the next month or so, new sports that people like but have never seen wagering on. Uh, we do hot dog eating contests. We do the Oscars. So, you know, it, it's just extensive. And, and I believe we have something for everyone. Aberbano told Newsy that while smartphones have allowed legal online sports gambling to flourish, she does think there needs to be ethical considerations made by those sports books and casinos moving forward about app design. It's been established in a couple of research papers now that uh, in-play betting is associated with problematic gambling behavior. Uh, it's not necessarily the case, we don't know yet, right? There's always more research that can be done, <laughs> uh, that it's a cause of problematic gambling, but it's certainly something where, I mean, if I'm getting alerts on my phone all the time that there's a new wager, it can be a potential trigger for somebody who's in recovery. DraftKings website urges players to bet responsibly and directs them where to get help. A few states like Michigan and Virginia direct some of the gaming revenues toward problem gambling help. But with all this money coming in, sportsbooks are likely to keep expanding their services. DraftKings is ready to offer services to new states that legalize online sports betting. The regulators and legislation and everything kind of has to set up for us to be able to come in. Uh, once that's in place, we're, we're ready to go. We can actually turn the switch immediately. Tyler Adkison, Newsy, Chicago. Here to talk with us a bit more about gambling is friend of ITL Newsy's Tyler Adkison, here to always make it plain for us. We heard from you about how smartphones play a key technological role in being able to let people bet on just about anything at any time. Um, has it also changed the ways that bets are actually constructed? Yeah, totally. You know, given the fact that so much of this happens on mobile devices, what really has changed is the instantaneousness and the 24-7 nature of being able to, you know, put a bet on nearly anything at any time. I think that a lot of people think about betting still in this traditional sense where you have these kind of pre-game predictions that you have to make, like who might win a game and by how much or something. But, you know, with smartphones, you're not really locked into just doing pre-game wagers. You can do live betting. Um, which essentially means that the odds for a given game are changing in real time, like during a commercial break or for a timeout. Um, according to Play USA, in-game betting is projected to make up about 70% of all sports bets placed in the U.S. by 2023. So to explain in-game betting a, a little bit, you know, let's say in the context of the NFL. I, I'm a Bears fan tentatively still for some reason, but let's say they're playing the <laughs> Cleveland Browns and the Browns go into the game as a three-point three favorite. You know, in, in a standard pregame bet, you'd have to guess whether or not Cleveland will win the game by three points or more. Now, say five minutes in the game, Cleveland goes up by three touchdowns and they've got 21 more points than Chicago. You know, at that point, you know Cleveland's going to win the game by three points most likely. With in-game wagering, basically those odds recalculate every time there's a break. So you can bet on the game again. Wow. I mean, I I'm not much of a betting fella, but if things are getting that granular, it's like, I don't know if it'll ever be for me because <laughs> that's just that's just more I'm going to have to keep up with. I mean, sports betting has changed so much. And I guess, you know, nowadays you can bet on just about any sport. And I, I have to ask, I know that you are a, a fan of video games. I mean, what about esports? Um, is there a market there? You 
wouldn't think so, but it is gigantic. Um, so according to Market Insight reports, the esports betting industry is expected to grow to about 13 billion US dollars by 2025. Part of that has to do with the fact, it, you know, uh, not to do another history lesson, but if you look back at the beginning of the pandemic around like March 20 or 20, you know, remember that like every professional sporting event was basically being canceled left and right. There were no sports to bet on. Although a lot of esports and tournaments do happen in physical places, you could still do professional esports in the comfort of your own home. Because of that, I think a lot of bookies looked to esports as being something that can fill this gap. And they really reap the benefits to it. You know, according to the UK Gambling Commission, esports betting grew by nearly 3,000% in 12 months alone. You know, keep in mind that a lot of these really popular esports, we'll say League of Legends or Counter-Strike, Dota 2, those teams make millions of dollars in prize money. There's lots of money around there. It's just that it's kind of a new field that we're sort of trying to get a sense of, you know, where are we going to see that money betting in? Where is it going to come from? But at this point, if you can think of a bet on just about anything, it'll probably show up. I know who I'm calling next time. You know, <laughs> I, I, I need to make a few dollars. Newsies, Tyler Adkison, much appreciated, man. Yeah, don't trust me that much, bud. Thank you. <laughs>
That's because bald eagles, national symbol since 1782, came close to being wiped out. We went after the mosquito with DDT spray. Thanks to a World War II era pesticide popular on American farms. Already it has been found to be highly effective against many kinds of agricultural insect pests. But DDT seeped into streams and rivers and fish, then to the bald eagles that ate them. Their eggshells became so fragile they'd break before hatching. By the 1960s, fewer than 500 eagle pairs were left anywhere. Even after DDT was banned in the 70s, they were hard to find. Colorado had just three known nests in the entire state. It used to be when we started birding, you'd see a bird on eagle every 10 years. And then it got to be a bald eagle every five years. And then you could, you know, see maybe one a year, which was really, really cool. The day we met them, Jan and Bruce Snyder spotted a bald eagle baker's dozen. We saw 13 of them over on the other side of Bar Lake. After nearly going extinct, bald eagles have made a huge comeback across the country. Dozens and dozens of eagles return to Bar Lake every winter, and so far this year, officials have counted up to 40 eagles a day. In Colorado, going from those three nests to... More than 200 at minimum, and we think we probably have more like four or 500. On this day, the Snyders are teaming up with Colorado Parks and Wildlife researcher Risa Conry, checking on a few of those nests at Bar Lake State Park near Denver. I would say this is a pretty precarious nest. Conry worries about this nest perched high in a dead tree. It's really got the support mainly of just one main stem. A similar nest blew down this spring, cracking the two eggs inside. Today, Conry wants to check out a report about a new nest going in nearby. Where are we headed right now? We are headed towards the new nesting location of the pair that lost their nest last year during a storm. A short hike and we see it. Our goal here is to get an accurate location on this nest tree in West 104.78039. The Snyders, volunteers with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, will keep tabs to see if the eagles move in permanently and maybe raise a few chicks. Colorado wildlife officials have now launched a four-year bald eagle study, outfitting birds with transmitters so they can be tracked and studied in real time. In July, this male flew hundreds of miles all the way to Wyoming. At a time when American bird populations are declining, researchers want to know how bald eagles are adapting to an increasing number of people moving to Colorado's front range and all the homes, highways, and shopping mall development that comes with them. Areas that uh, used to be hunting areas for these eagles yeah. are now housing developments. Some of those eagles' nests are getting hemmed in and we're interested to see whether they stick around and manage to adapt with what's left or whether they leave for a new area. For now, the bald eagles seem to be sticking around and thriving, but Conry says time will tell. It's a success story with some nuances, I guess. You know, we're still concerned and we still want to make sure it's our national bird. They're fun to spot and fun to watch for people. And these days, spotting a bald eagle has gotten a lot easier. Clayton Sandell, Newsy, Denver. After the break, we're bringing you more of our Two America series. We'll be looking at how housing discrimination has led some neighborhoods to experience higher temperatures than others. Our new To America series shows you community issues in a new way. You'll get different perspectives, but we're not pitting one side against the other. We're giving voices to people you may not have heard from before. Today, we're reporting on redlining. That's when banks would deny loans to people living in neighborhoods the banks considered risky. And usually risky meant majority black. Redlining was banned more than 50 years ago, but it's still hurting those neighborhoods today. With temperatures rising across the globe due to climate change, data now shows that those redlined neighborhoods are on average hotter than others. Our Vanessa Mashanya went to Richmond, Virginia, where they have a solution to make those neighborhoods greener and bring down the temperature. Duran Chavis is trying to right an environmental wrong in his neighborhood that's been generations in the making. And these are all major arteries in the city that lack tree canopy. 
On Richmond's south side, heat radiates from the asphalt and relief is hard to find. This green garden is a way to begin to rectify that, but he says the way his neighborhood is set up today was no mistake. This is a map of Richmond from the 1930s that banks used to determine who to loan to. The neighborhoods highlighted in red, including the south side, were redlined. Looking closer at the reasons, it was redlined because its population was 95% black. This isn't just a Richmond problem. 200 American cities were redlined. Today, the majority of those redlined neighborhoods are primarily black, Latino, and low income. According to research done at the nearby University of Richmond, formerly redlined neighborhoods are on average five degrees hotter and can be up to 20 degrees hotter than neighborhoods that were not. Because of a lack of investments over decades, formerly redlined neighborhoods have less parks and trees and more asphalt and buildings, leaving folks who live there more susceptible to heat-related illness and impacts of climate change. This is called the urban heat island effect. What does that say when the neighborhood that you lived in, all the people look like you and there's all this delight, all this abandoned property, then you go across the bridge onto another side of town and you see just all of the things and but none of those folks look like you i think that that does something to the consciousness of a people we're looking at 17.6 acres that has been designated a the first new public park in the south side of the city of richmond since the 1970s a few streets over from broad rock Hidden behind Kudzu and Chainlink is a dirt path that will one day soon lead to a brand new green space. A lot of different initiatives that are happening in the city right now, it's part of a realization um, of how past actions have led to current realities. When the city of Richmond saw the data on the heat and green space disparity, they put together a team and made it their mission to make sure everyone is within a 10 minute walk of a park. What I think more green space coming into Southside will show is that we value the people that live here and we want people to enjoy the space right outside their front door. Javon Bowles is a community advocate on the park initiative, making sure the South Side has a voice in its creation. She says while there's excitement around the project, the skepticism of some neighbors cannot be ignored. There has been a lot of broken promises, particularly in the 8th and the 9th district of Southside Richmond. However, a lot of people are also grateful for the opportunity for people to see, again, that there is something beautiful already right here. This green here is where people do meditation and yoga. And it's, it's dope because it's like, that's something else that I never imagined that I would see cruising down this block, you know, when I was a kid. Addressing systemic wrongs that were put into motion generations ago takes time, but it also takes care. And while neighbors like Duran put in the work, he also hopes the care he and others put into these spaces catches on. I'm Vanessa Rashan, you're reporting. Stick with Newsy for more from our Two America series, which seeks to highlight underrepresented stories from across the country. Now, you probably know U.S. troops left Afghanistan this summer, but after the break, we'll tell you more about one Middle Eastern country where U.S. troops are still in a war zone. In his address to the United Nations General Assembly last month, President Joe Biden had this to say. I stand here today for the first time in 20 years with the United States not at war. We've turned the page. It was the culmination of his campaign promise to end forever wars. But here's the thing. While the U.S. may have pulled its last troops out of Afghanistan, there are still U.S. boots on the ground in other Middle Eastern war zones, including in Syria. Quite frankly, that comment couldn't have come at a worse time um, because 24 hours earlier, the United States conducted an airstrike in northwestern Syria, uh, taking out two senior al-Qaeda operatives. Uh, and we've got special forces deployed in dozens of countries around the world engaged directly or indirectly um, in various forms of conflict. Um, and so, no, of course, the United States is not no longer at war. Um, we are arguably engaged in more countries against more adversaries 
most of them non-state actors, uh, than we have been at any point over the last 20 years. As of now, there are about 900 US soldiers there, mainly in the country's northeast. You can even see the bases on Google Earth if you know where to look. Now you might be wondering what exactly those troops are doing. Well, for former President Donald Trump, they were there for the oil. Uh, we're keeping the oil, we have the oil, the oil is secure. Uh, we left troops behind only for the oil. Biden's administration hasn't made securing the oil quite as big of a deal as Trump did, but keeping it from being used to finance terrorism is still part of the mission. The main line from the Pentagon has stayed pretty much the same over the years. The US has troops on the ground in Syria to help in the fight against ISIS. To do that, the US is supporting a group called the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF. It's a predominantly Kurdish militia group that has been the US's main partner on the ground in Syria fighting ISIS. That partnership was shaken up in 2019 when Trump allowed neighboring Turkey to invade the part of Syria where US and SDF troops were trying to keep the peace. Since then, Russia, whose military supports the Syrian government on the other side of this conflict, has also expanded its presence in the Northeast. They are still there to counter ISIS, but a lot of what we see them doing now includes patrols around the Turkish-Syrian border, as well as the main highway in the area. They have occasionally ran into trouble with some of the locals while doing this, like when we investigated a shootout in a pro-government village last March. The Russian patrols in the area can also pose a problem. There have been multiple incidents between the Russian and US patrols where they blocked each other or ran each other off the road. All of this really puts President Biden in a tricky position. If he decides to pull the plug on Syria and withdraw the last of the US troops there, then the ally SDF is likely going to end up in a fight with Turkey again. Syria writ large, the humanitarian uh, state of affairs isn't very good, um, but certainly a US military presence is staving off any potential major disasters, mostly military disasters, a military incursion by the Turks, a military incursion by the regime, an ISIS resurgence, all of those things would have an enormously negative impact on the humanitarian situation in the Northeast. But as long as the U.S. stays, Biden can't really say he's ended the U.S. forever wars and the American troops in Syria will still be under threat from all sorts of risks in the country. Here with us to talk a bit more about U.S. drone warfare is Newsy's Jake Godin. Jake, first question for you. What is the latest when it comes to U.S. drone strikes in Syria and surrounding countries? The U.S. is still doing drone strikes. Um, there was one announced not, not too long ago about a Al-Qaeda commander in Syria who was apparently targeted. Just because Biden is saying that America is no longer at war doesn't mean that the United States still isn't engaging in the war on terror. So there's, you know, there's going to be drone strikes from here on out. Here on out. And how exactly is the Biden administration continuing to justify these drone strikes and this war on terror? Well, it mainly comes from the, you know, the 2001 authorization of use of military force, which was used for, it's been used for all sorts of operations all over the world, all under essentially the idea of targeting Al Qaeda or anything kind of affiliated with Al Qaeda or just kind of terrorists in general. And so, as long as that's around and unaltered, then you know the United States still has the ability and uh, to do drone strikes wherever they deem necessary in terms of like threats, which could be kind of broadly defined. And I guess one of the things that a lot of a lot of us have been focusing on lately is the drone strike in Kabul um, that killed a number of civilians. I know that you know, if not for the journalists that were on the ground and able to cover this so quickly, we might not have known about this particular drone strike. How often do we see, you know, kind of missed targets uh, in this way? Yeah, all the time. Uh, it happens a lot, a lot more than you would think and a lot more than the Pentagon has actually admitted. Um, the thing is, this was a very visible strike that happened in Kabul. It was 
there were a lot of journalists on the ground and there was a lot of like visual evidence, whether that was videos or photos or CCTV footage that allowed journalists, human rights type people to investigate the strike pretty thoroughly and pretty quickly show that it wasn't, you know, these were civilians that were targeted. And, but there are strikes in more rural places uh, in Afghanistan or in Syria or Iraq or Somalia where there isn't as robust of a presence of either, you know, human rights type people or journalists or just people with cameras who can like take pictures and uh, kind of upload something to the internet that allows others from their desks, you know, in DC or New York or wherever to kind of examine what happened. And so there's groups that try to do this, that try to keep track of like how many civilian casualties there have been from US strikes or strikes from US allies. And just in Iraq and Syria, uh, a group named Air Wars um, has tracked what they consider to be uh, likely cases of civilian deaths from airstrikes. And it's, it ranges from 8,000 to 13,000 people. The United States, the, the coalition has only admitted to killing just uh, like 1,400 people, um, civilians. So there's a big disparity between the numbers here. And it's not often that the United States government comes out and says, oh yes, we accidentally killed these civilians. We had bad intel. Um, it, so it's a pretty rare occasion to see that, but it happens all the time. Pretty interesting that you bring up the fact that, you know, the civilians are killed in these strikes all the time, but it's very rare for the, you know, the military to come out and say, you know, we made a mistake. What impact will this have on U.S. drone warfare in this region going forward? Well, you would hope that they would manage to kind of lock down the the way that these drone strikes happen and make it so it's a much tighter process that doesn't, not as, as open to anybody kind of pulling trigger that has to go through a lot of layers to kind of discourage these, you know, quick attacks that might uh, end up killing civilians. But the thing is, there's, you know, the U.S. government's been doing this for 20 years, and they're still making mistakes. So it's kind of hard to see how much more they can do other than just tightening up the, the kind of like chain of command or like the chain of custody for whoever has that decision. One thing we can hope for is more transparency in how these strikes are conducted. And then that way, you can have human rights organizations or journalists or just anybody kind of holding the government accountable for these strikes. And, uh, you know, that would be something that would really help, I think, tamp down on civilian strikes because it would make it would kind of up the requirements that they would need to do to pull these uh, to like to pull the trigger. This is Jake Godin. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, folks, we're shifting our focus just a bit. When you're back, we'll tell you about an exhibit that tells the stories of different eras through fashion. Fashion is protean. It's constantly changing. I mean, remember when we all collectively thought quadruple XL tall white tees and soldier boy sized jean shorts were cool? They were a flex then, but that was a rough time. But the clothes we wear can say way more about how on point you are or if you're off the mark. It can also speak to what society is going through at the time. For instance, our collective shift to sweatpants during the pandemic. A new exhibit in Philadelphia aims to capture what was happening in the country by going through a history of different looks. National reporter Maya Rodriguez gives us a behind the scenes look. From an elaborate ceremonial wedding dress to the uniform of an NFL player, clothing can tell the story of a person as well as a time and place. It says a great deal about what's happening at the moment. Sarah Lynn is co-curator of The Stories We Wear, a new exhibit at the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. Hundreds of items stretching back more than 2,500 years show not just what people wore, but what they experienced at the time. It says so much about the culture in which they're living, about their time period. Like these samurai items used during a children's celebration. Some belonged to a California family who worked hard to keep them, 
even as they were sent to a Japanese internment camp during World War II. So it tells this wonderful story both about Children's Day and about the importance of samurai and that history, but it also tells this really important story about American history and how we hold on to our heritage. There's also this dress, sewn during the Depression. An elastic waistband and a hem that could be raised and lowered allowed the dress to be shared by multiple women in a family. This is during the Depression when, um, when money might be a little bit tight and the idea of a well-made garment needing to fit multiple members of the family might, might make sense. There's the gown of an opera star worn by Marian Anderson and a dress fit for a princess like this one which belonged to Grace Kelly along with an ensemble fit for a queen, a drag queen that is. This one embodies so many parts of performance. Drag itself is performance. But the museum wanted everyone to get involved. Using the hashtag stories we wear, people anywhere can share pictures of what they wear and the stories behind it, like these current COVID era nurses did, which then can appear on these interactive monitors in the exhibit. We wanted to ensure that everyone could contribute to this exhibition. So here is an opportunity for people to share heirlooms or keepsakes that have been passed down in their family that are important to them. But it's not just about sharing what you wear on your skin, but what your skin might be wearing too. Why did you decide to include tattoos in the exhibit? You know, we tend to get tattoos that, that embody something about our personal identity. So we wanted people to share their stories about their tattoos. All part of the stories we wear that helps tell our own. In Philadelphia, I'm Maya Rodriguez. Miami Beach is known as a place to go to for a good time. If you went for spring break in college, then you know exactly what I mean. But there's a lot more to it than bars and beaches. It's also a hub for art and design. One organization is working to preserve the Art Deco houses that are unique to this area. National reporter Bo Evans gives us an inside look at some of this historic architecture. Miami Beach is home to one of the largest collections of Art Deco buildings from last century, including Al Capone's house. And the fight to preserve these buildings is on here and around the country. I grew up here in Miami Beach in an old house from the 1930s, and I was always so fascinated by the older architecture. My name is Daniel Serrato. I'm the executive director of the Miami Design Preservation League here in Miami Beach, Florida. late morning in Miami Beach when I met Daniel at the Art Deco Center. He's eager to explain what they do at the Design Preservation League. This talks about the main styles that we have in Miami Beach. Art Deco uh, being one of the predominant styles that we want to protect. Is there a building in town that's like kind of your favorite? It's hard to say it's like choosing your favorite child. Yeah, he loves architecture and he loves Miami Beach. What well, makes Miami Beach the state's number one beach for uh, vacation destinations? We strongly believe that it's the arts and culture, the architecture, and uh, the melting pot of different diverse uh, visitors. But Daniel and the MDPL have taken on a new fight. They want to preserve a house as a historic site. It sits on a man-made island in the middle of Biscayne Bay, and it was one of the first homes built on this island, Palm Island, in 1922. The house that sits at 93 Palm Avenue had a very infamous owner, notorious bootlegger, mobster, and tax avoider, Al Capone. A lot of people will tell you he was a very bad person, and he was, but he also played a real role in the history of our city. The house was purchased over the summer by a developer who quickly applied for a demolition permit. That's when Daniel and the MDPL stepped in. Here's a diving board where Capone would dive off of the back of his uh, cabana. We reached out to the owner, but were told he had withdrawn the demolition application and sold the property. The fight to preserve the Capone house and Miami Beach is emblematic of what different parts of the United States are grappling with as the country continues to build. Some of these sites which are historic may be recognized more so in the future. It's not that old. We still have memory there, but these places may become 
storied. They already are storied. Scott Montgomery is an art history professor at the University of Denver and researches music venues of the 60s and beyond. He's worried that in pursuit of the development and profit, we may cast our history aside. My favorite cautionary tale are the medieval walls of uh, Florence, Italy. They tore the walls down to make uh, circuit roads, to modernize and build it up. But since then, I think most of the city of Florence has lamented the loss of these walls that were part of its identity, part of its medieval charm. Daniel wants to make sure that Miami Beach doesn't walk down a similar path. We have seen a big increase in applications to demolish historically significant but unprotected homes. In the last about 15 years, there have been almost 300 of these homes that have been approved for demolition. It's such an important part of our history and it'd almost be like a cookie dough ice cream, taking all the cookie dough out and just being left with vanilla. If we lose all of these homes to big white boxes, what, what sets us apart from any other city? In Miami Beach with photojournalist Drew Snadecki, I'm Bo Evans reporting. All right, gang, we're gonna take a quick break, but now that all the social media sites are up and running again, give us a shout on social using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Before we hand things off, let's close the loop and take you through our top stories tonight. Back in 2018, the Supreme Court overturned a law that had effectively prohibited states from authorizing sports gambling, except Nevada, obviously. Half of US states approve some form of sports betting. Currently, that's 26 states plus DC. But you know that saying about all things in moderation? Yeah, gambling can be super addictive. Of course, a big reason behind those concerns is the cutting edge convenience of it all. It's been established in a couple of research papers now that uh, in-play betting is associated with problematic gambling behavior. Uh, it's not necessarily the case, we don't know yet, right? There's always more research that can be done, <laughs> uh, that it's a cause of problematic gambling, but it's certainly something where, I mean, if I'm getting alerts on my phone all the time that there's a new wager, it can be a potential trigger for somebody who's in recovery. While the U.S. may have pulled its last troops out of Afghanistan, there are still U.S. boots on the ground in other Middle Eastern war zones, including in Syria. And we've got special forces deployed in dozens of countries around the world engaged directly or indirectly um, in various forms of conflict. Um, and so, no, of course, the United States is not no longer at war. Um, we are arguably engaged in more countries against more adversaries, most of them non-state actors, uh, than we have been at any point over the last 20 years. As of now, there are about 900 US soldiers there, mainly in the country's Northeast. You can even see the bases on Google Earth if you know where to look. The main line from the Pentagon has stayed pretty much the same over the years the U.S. has troops on the ground in Syria to help in the fight against ISIS. To do that, the U.S. is supporting a group called the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF. It's a predominantly Kurdish militia group that has been the U.S.'s main partner on the ground in Syria fighting ISIS. But as long as the U.S. stays, Biden can't really say he's ended the U.S. forever wars and the American troops in Syria will still be under threat from all sorts of risks in the country. That's it for In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. If you only caught the tail end of this episode, don't worry. You can check us out on YouTube for the full thing. Evening Debrief is next.